The VHS movies have a dedicated cult following, making them a seriously essential franchise for any anthology horror fans and movie buffs in general. While they cater to a specific subgenre that may not suit everyone's taste, they provide a refreshing departure from traditional slasher or haunted house horror films. The first VHS film, produced by Bloody Disgusting and released in 2012, marked the beginning of this praiseworthy franchise, and the horror genre community has since not been able to keep calm. Although many consider the VHS movies, especially the first two sequels in 2013 and 2014, to offer a higher level of quality, I think all of the films had something wickedly sinister to offer, and each of the anthology parts was amazing in their own right. Now that there's news that the fifth part is set to have a Halloween release, we thought it was time to brush up on the five movies in chronological order. Oh, and just a side note, I have chosen to exclude the two spin-offs, that is, the 2016 movie Siren and the 2023 movie Kids vs. Alien. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. VHS 99 2022 So, unlike the previous four installments of the franchise, this one doesn't have any overarching story or a frame narrative and seems like a true anthology. Shredding. In Shredding, we have ourselves a punk rock band called Rack. The name is made up from the initials of its members, Rachel, Anchor, Chris, and Caleb. They are known for their pranks and web show recordings. In their last stunt, they break into the Colony Underground, a former music venue that burned down three years ago, tragically claiming the lives of all members of another punk band, Bitch Cat, during a stampede. The tape briefly switches to a demo reel featuring Bitch Cat performing and being interviewed. Returning to the main story, the band members explore the condemned venue, and Anchor expresses his fear of the Pahoot, which is basically the Indian version of ghosts. More specifically, entities believed to possess those who disturb their resting place. The group tricks Anchor into thinking they're being possessed, but he storms off, wishing the Pahoot upon them. The remaining trio uses inflatable sex dolls filled with gelatin to reenact the stampede that killed Bitch Cat. Suddenly, a ghostly voice warns them to leave the stage, and Caleb is violently taken into the air, resulting in his gruesome death. Rachel and Chris attempt to escape, but Bitch Cat's vengeful ghosts capture their camera and film as they brutally kill and dismember the remaining band members. The tape glitches, revealing the reanimated and possessed Rack performing one of Bitch Cat's songs on stage before it ends. Suicide Bid In Suicide Bid, college freshman Lily strives to join the prestigious sorority Beta Sigma Eta. She chooses a suicide bid, applying only to this sorority, risking exclusion if rejected. Lily's efforts seem successful when she's invited for a night out with the sorority's sisters by Annie. As part of a hazing ritual, the sisters take Lily to a nearby graveyard. There, she's challenged to spend the night buried in a coffin, recreating an urban legend where a freshman named Guiltine did the same 20 years ago, but disappeared when the coffin was unearthed rumored to have entered the underworld. Lily enters the coffin with a box containing reassurance items and a video camera. The sisters start pranking her, knocking on the coffin and terrifying her with large spiders from the box. Lily panics, ringing the emergency bell the sisters provided, but they continue to torment her. A police car arrives due to the noise, but the officers can't hear Lily's cries and eventually leave. During a rainstorm, the coffin partially floods. Just as the water stops rising, a ghoul, the relentless spirit of Guiltine, bursts through the coffin lid and attacks Lily. The next morning, the sorority sisters find the grave full of water and the coffin empty. They agree to keep the incident secret. That night, they wake up buried in coffins, Lily now a ghoul herself appears with Guiltine in Annie's coffin, revealing that she made a deal with Guiltine to spare her soul in exchange for the sorority sisters. 
Ozzy's Dungeon. Ozzy's Dungeon is a children's game show where contestants compete in physical challenges to meet Ozzy and have a wish granted. In the final challenge, Donna, eager to help her struggling family escape their neighborhood, is severely injured by a rival contestant. Shockingly, the host doesn't intervene. Years later, the show's host awakens in a basement, captive to Donna's domineering mother, Deborah. Deborah had groomed her daughter to win the show. With her family's compliance, they force the host to endure torturous versions of the show's challenges, threatening him with acid. He fails but offers to take the family to Ozzy for their wish. The group heads to the studio where the show was filmed, sneaking in through the rear entrance. They discover a cave behind the dungeon door. Inside, they find Ozzy, and Donna reveals her wish. Ozzy births a monstrous creature that grants her wish. The girl had wished for the monster to burn the faces of the host and her family, and that's what happened. The Gawkers In The Gawkers, directed and co-written by Tyler McIntyre and Chris Lee Hill, Brady, a young teenager, creates stop-motion videos using toy soldiers and his older brother Dylan's camera. Dylan and his friends Kurt, Mark, and Boner exclude Brady and engage in pranks, skate park tricks, and odd dares like taunting Boner to eat a large patch of snakeskin. Their attention shifts to Sandra, an attractive neighbor, and they use Dylan's camera to spy on her. Brady befriends Sandra, leading to jealousy among Dylan's friends. They pressure Brady into installing spyware on her computer to secretly watch her via webcam. Reluctantly, Brady agrees and installs the spyware, but as they watch Sandra, she undergoes a shocking transformation revealing herself as a gorgon with snake-like hair. Sandra seems to notice their intrusion and attacks them, turning Kurt, Mark, and Boner to stone. Dylan escapes, while Brady returns to apologize to Sandra, racked with guilt. Sandra, unrelenting, petrifies both Brady and Dylan. The tape ends with Sandra slowly approaching the camera, held in Dylan's stony hand. To Hell and Back In To Hell and Back, Nate and Troy are videographers who are hired by a coven of witches to film a ritual on New Year's Eve, 1999. The witches plan to summon a demon named Ukaban, using Kirsten as a vessel. During the ritual, an unwanted demon named Fergus disrupts it and drags Nate and Troy to Hell. In Hell, they face demons traps, and meet Mabel, a damned soul, who offers to help their escape in exchange for their assistance in writing her name in the witch's spellbook. Nate and Troy must find Ukaban to return to Earth before midnight when the veil between worlds is thinnest. They encounter demons and bicker constantly. Eventually, they confront Ukaban and a cult of demons preparing to possess Kirsten's body. Nate and Troy defeat the cultists and jump into Ukaban's stomach as the ritual begins. Back on Earth, Nate inhabits Kirsten's body, and the witches, frustrated by their failed ritual, kill the friends. However, Troy manages to write Mabel's name in the witch's book before dying. The tape then returns to Dylan and Brady's stony bodies, and as the credits roll, the witches perform a ritual to bring Mabel back to Earth. VHS 94 Holy Hell, the prologue of the film, begins with a mysterious woman in white clothing inhaling vapors from a gelatinous substance on her hands. But in the next scene, we see that her eyes have been gouged. The frame narrative then shifts to a SWAT team, consisting of a few men and their cameraman, Gary, preparing to raid a warehouse in what they believe is a drug bust operation. As they approach the warehouse, House, they unexpectedly find a private jet parked behind it. From the speakers, a distorted female voice utters cryptic phrases. All are welcome. All are watching. 
Finally, followers, tonight is the night you've been waiting for. Track my signal. And then she goes on about the signal, but anyway. Inside the warehouse, the SWAT team goes through the narrow corridors, discovering prison cell-like rooms with television sets showing static. In one of the rooms, they encounter a deceased man with gouged out eyes and the same vicious white substance, which seems to be the target of their operation. The stuff was dripping onto the floor. Continuing their search for suspects, the team enters a room depicted in a VHS tape and finds more dead cult members. Slater decides to send the blue team to investigate the upper floor, while the remaining officers press forward. In the midst of their exploration, a television in the room activates, playing a news broadcast. Storm Drain In Westerville, Ohio, a feisty Channel 6 news reporter named Holly Marciano and her cameraman Jeff investigate reports of the Rat Man, a local cryptid said to inhabit the town's storm drains. They interview witnesses and venture into a storm drain where they discover the dwellings that the homeless have made. Inside, they encounter a man covered in black slime who says nothing but the word Rotma. Frightened, they try to escape but are captured by sewer dwellers. Deeper in the sewers, they are led to a church minister who reveals his vicious plans for a new order that would take the world by storm. He summons the Rat Man itself, a truly grotesque half-human, half-rat creature who they all worship as a god. The Rat Man kills Jeff with its black vomit, melting his face. Holly is brought before the creature and it growls in approval as she screams. The film then transitions to an infomercial before returning to a news broadcast. Holly has been rescued but exhibits strange behavior, substituting some of her words with the word Ratma. She suddenly vomits black liquid on her co-anchor, killing him on the air. But she remains rather unfazed and concludes her report signifying her conversion to the sewer cult and ends it all by hailing the creature. The Empty Wake In The Empty Wake, Haley works at Jensen Funeral Home, where she's tasked with hosting a wake for Andrew Edwards. During a stormy night, Haley becomes suspicious about Andrew's death and calls her friend Sharon to check the obituaries. Strange noises from the casket and its movement disturb her, but she's reassured by her colleague Tim, who attributes it to gases escaping the body. Later, a a man named Gustav arrives, claiming to be Andrew's relative. After an unsettling encounter, Sharon reveals that Andrew had committed suicide by jumping from a church roof while shouting gibberish. As the storm intensifies, the power fluctuates and the building's front doors are mysteriously chained shut. Haley finds the casket tipped over and is attacked by Andrew's reanimated corpse, but he now misses a head. She manages to distract it temporarily, but is eventually attacked. The storm culminates in a tornado and the camera cuts out. When the storm subsides, Haley, now possessed by Andrew's spirit, crawls out of a window and into the surroundings. In the frame narrative, the officers continue to explore the warehouse. They come across gruesome scenes with body parts scattered across the floor. A few mannequins and inverted crosses hanging from the ceiling, etc. As panic sets in, they decide to leave the building. But of course, another footage begins to play. The Subject In the subject set in Indonesia, a man awakens to discover his body has been replaced by mechanical spider legs. He catches fire but is saved by Dr. James Sahundra, a mad scientist aiming to create a cyborg but kidnaps people to serve as. He performs a lobotomy on a young woman, known as Subject 99, and sedates Subject 99, a young man. He manages to turn Subject 98 into a robotic creature with blade arms powered with springs and Subject 99 into a cyborg. The story shifts its perspective mainly to Subject 99. He sees the crazy
see scientists celebrating the success as news reports mention a surge in disappearances, leading to suspicion of James kidnapping his patients. The woman who had the initials S.A. as her previous self is briefly shown on screen, and James attempts to erase her memories. S.A. wakes up during the procedure, confronts James, and tries to free herself. Just then, heavily armored police officers arrive to arrest James. As the officers break in, James is shot in the head. They discover Subject 99 and debate whether to kill her or spare her, given her altered state. But thanks to a sudden blackout, Subject 99 escapes while Jono, the timid officer recording the raid, watches silently. An explosion follows, incapacitating most of the officers. Subject 98 awakens and kills them. S.A. escapes, finding blueprints for her cyborg body, a cannon arm, and parts of her old self preserved in a jar of formaldehyde. After a moment of self-realization and anger at her new form, she equips the cannon arm and fights her way through the building, defending herself against the surviving soldiers and encountering more failed experiments by James. She encounters Jono, spares him, and is attacked by the commander, whom Jono kills. Subject 98 also attacks, but she defeats him by removing his brain. She collapses beside Jono, her battery nearly depleted, yet she manages to escape. Terror. In the film, the First Patriots Movement Militia, a white supremacist extremist group, plans to bomb a local government building to reclaim America. Their secure compound is located near Detroit, Michigan, featuring surveillance-equipped rooms and a prison cell with wooden crosses. Bob, the group's cameraman, Greg, the leader, and Chuck, a member, enter the cell, where they execute a captive man. A propaganda video by Greg reveals their intention to rid America of what they consider evil. Group members scout the government building for security cameras and entry points. Meanwhile, Slater, introduced from the framing narrative, supplies them with weapons. They routinely shoot a vampire captive, extracting its explosive blood to use it as a substitute for a bomb. They test it on a rabbit, which explodes in sunlight. Bob joins Steve, stationed in the security camera room, and and together, they mockingly interact with the vampire's corpse, which, of course, results in a blood shower. An emergency alarm rings, signaling danger. Steve is missing. And chaos erupts as the group discovers Steve's <laughs> severed head thrown from the compound. Another member accidentally fires a truck-mounted machine gun, causing casualties. Steve, drenched in vampire blood, explodes in daylight. The surviving members Greg, Tom, Bob, and Jimmy vow to eliminate the vampire. They locate it in the attic, where Tom is brutally attacked, and Greg fires wildly. Jimmy is killed by the vampire in the attic. Bob's shots miss, and Greg is shot in the leg. The vampire attacks Bob, tearing his face off, and then drags Greg into a cage. The vampire then exposes itself to sunlight, leading to its explosive death and the compound's destruction. As for the original narrative, it turns out that two of the SWAT team members orchestrated the whole thing to create snuff films. VHS 2012. The film, as you may know, is a series of chilling vignettes, all interconnected by the overarching concept of found footage, originating from one single VHS tape discovered in a strange room in the strangest setting. In the prologue of the movie, the frame focuses on a group of delinquent individuals who document their reckless and criminal deeds, ranging from vandalizing an abandoned residence to assaulting a woman in a dimly lit parking area, but they are not content and wish to increase the scope of their criminal activities. Their lives take a sinister and rather unfortunate turn when an anonymous benefactor offers them a substantial sum to infiltrate a mysterious house and pilfer a single VHS tape. Nothing more, nothing less. Eager to broaden their field of illicit expertise, 
The gang accepts this unusual proposition. As they venture into the eerie house, they stumble upon the lifeless figure of an elderly man seated before an array of television screens, all of which were playing a static white noise. While the others explored the house, vandalizing it and looking for stuff to steal, one of them, named Brad, remained in the room. He was clearly transfixed by the deceased man's unsettling presence and decided to inspect a tape left within the VCR. And that's the first part, and the anthology begins. Amateur Night. Three friends, Shane, Patrick, and Clint, have rented a motel room with the initial intention of meeting women for a night of casual stuff. Clint wears glasses equipped with a hidden camera and microphone, hoping to document the whole thing as an amateur film. While they begin their wild night of bar hopping, Clint crosses paths with Lily, a mysterious and reserved young woman who utters only the phrase, I like you. In their quest to pick up Lily, the trio also persuades another young woman, Lisa, to accompany them to their motel room. However, the evening takes a turn when Shane, driven by his desires, attempts to force himself on Lisa. Patrick, with a sense of responsibility, intervenes and stops Shane from doing whatever he was doing. Meanwhile, Lily continues to show an unusual interest in Clint, but it's Shane who makes advances toward her instead. Oh, Shane, you horny bugger. As the night begins to turn darker, Clint begins to notice peculiarities about Lily, particularly her clawed and scaly feet. Despite his observations, Shane and Patrick remain oblivious to these subtle anomalies, cause why not? Lily seemingly responds to Shane's advances, leading to the beginning of what looked like a threesome between her, Shane, and Clint. Overwhelmed by the situation, Clint excuses himself and goes to the bathroom. In his absence, Patrick attempts to take Clint's place in the encounter, but Lily doesn't want him. She may have gone a bit overboard in saying no, or did she? Suddenly, Patrick rushes into the bathroom, his hand severely injured, claiming that Lily bit him. As they return to Shane, Lily undergoes a startling transformation. She pulls on the big guns, you know, the fangs and stuff, and attacks Shane, killing him. Clint and Patrick find themselves trapped in the room, hiding in the bathroom. Patrick, still naked, arms himself with a shower curtain rod to confront Lily. Yeah. <laughs> like that was going to stop her. Clint, in the meantime, tries to awaken Lisa. Lily overpowers Patrick, attacks him, and drinks his blood. In a desperate attempt to escape, Clint flees the room, but stumbles down a stairwell, injuring his wrist. Lily catches up with him, her appearance now grotesquely altered. Surprisingly, instead of attacking him, she attempts to seduce him. When Clint remains unresponsive, Lily believes she has been rejected and begins to weep. Well, not much you can expect from a man whose friends you just killed. Clint, in a frantic bid for hell, pleads with bystanders, but he is unexpectedly lifted into the sky by Lily, who has transformed into a winged creature. It is revealed that Lily is, in fact, a succubus in search of a suitable mate. As Clint is carried away, his glasses fall from his face, hitting the ground as the footage abruptly concludes. We then go back to the frame story, where Brad has gone missing. Meanwhile, Brad's friends go to the basement and stumble upon a trove of unmarked VHS tapes. So, they begin to gather all the tapes to ensure they retrieve the correct one. As they collect the tapes, one of them catches a fleeting glimpse of a mysterious figure wandering in the shadows. Upstairs, Rox, one of the criminals, replaces the tape in the VCR with a different one and settles down to watch it. Second Honeymoon Directed and written by Ty West, Second Honeymoon tells the story of Sam and Stephanie, a newlywed couple embarking on a honeymoon trip to Arizona. Stephanie decides to document their entire journey with a camcorder, a beautiful gesture some might say. During their visit to a Wild West themed attraction named Wild West Junction, Stephanie encounters a mechanical fortune teller dressed as a prospector. The contraption delivers a prediction suggesting that she will soon experience a joyful reunion 
reunion with a loved one, emphasizing her trusting nature, which can make her vulnerable. Later, a mysterious woman approaches Sam and Stephanie's motel room, attempting to persuade Sam to provide her with a ride the following day, albeit with an awkward demeanor. In the dead of night while the couple slumbers, an intruder breaks into their room. The trespasser activates the camcorder and captures disturbing footage of themselves, caressing Stephanie's buttocks with a switchblade. This intruder pilfers $100 from Sam's wallet and dips his toothbrush into the toilet. The next day, en route to their Grand Canyon adventure, Sam discovers the missing money and accuses Stephanie of theft. She vehemently denies any involvement. That evening, the sinister stranger infiltrates the room once more, brutally stabbing Sam in the neck with the switchblade. The camera records as Sam chokes on his own blood. The video then reveals the identity of the killer, a masked woman who had previously interacted with Stephanie. She cleans the blade while sharing a passionate moment with Stephanie, revealing their secret relationship. The recording concludes with Stephanie and her lover driving away with Stephanie inquiring about the footage. Back in the frame narrative, Rox becomes physically uncomfortable looking at the tape. Unbeknownst to him, the old man's lifeless body has mysteriously vanished. Meanwhile, in the basement, the other criminals engage in a debate about the tape's significance and ponder the possibility of creating copies to generate extra income. The story then transitions to the next tape. Tuesday the 17th Directed and written by Glenn McQuaid, Tuesday the 17th revolves around Joey, Spider, Samantha, and their new friend Wendy, who go for their annual trip to a remote forest lake. Joey diligently films everything while Wendy guides them through the woods, talking about the past accidents that befell her friends. Disturbingly, the camera captures glitched images of the mutilated bodies when certain areas are filmed. Their idyllic day takes a sinister turn when they stumble upon the mutilated remains of a pig, and Wendy ominously hints at impending doom. As the group unwinds by the lake, Wendy speaks about a past murder spree in the same area, which she claims took many lives. Her friends dismiss it, but soon, Samantha is brutally killed, a knife pierced straight into her face. Spider attempts to flee but is attacked by this mysterious presence known only as the Glitch, which has this featureless redhead. Back at the lake, Joey begins to wonder about the whereabouts of Spider and Samantha, but she says they have departed. She tries to seduce him, but he senses that something is really off. Wendy drops her facade and confesses her motive. She lured them into the woods as bait to confront and eliminate the Glitch, the very entity responsible for the murder of her friends. The Glitch silently approaches Joey and fatally slashes his throat. Wendy escapes, luring the Glitch into a pit trap and subsequently a bear trap, briefly immobilizing it. Attempting to capture evidence of the Glitch up close, Wendy's hand is injured. Wendy flees through the woods, warning to anyone who might come across the tape never to venture into the area. The Glitch eventually closes in. Wendy successfully traps the Glitch on a bed of spikes, but it vanishes. It re-emerges in a tree, pouncing on Wendy, bludgeoning her to death with the camera, and then mutilating her abdomen. The horrifying footage concludes with Wendy's lifeless body twitching and convulsing violently as the camera succumbs to glitches, hinting that she may be transforming into a glitch herself. Returning to the frame story, the old man's body has reappeared in the room, but like Brad, Rox has gone missing. Zack and Gary begin to worry, and Gary suggests searching through the tapes for answers. Zack replaces the current tape with a new one and settles in to watch. The Sick Thing That Happened to Emily When She Was Younger Directed by Joe Swamberg and written by Simon Barrett, this is all about a series of computer video chats. Emily tells her aspiring doctor boyfriend James about a peculiar bump on her arm, linking it to a childhood incident. As she gives James a tour of her apartment, she hears some strange noises. Upon investigating, Emily witnesses a ghost but childlike entity darting into her room and slamming the door. The following night, Emily continues to hear the unsettling noises and investigates once more, only to encounter the ghostly entity when she turns on the lights. Perplexed and unnerved, she consults her landlord, who dismisses any history of children or deaths in the apartment complex. 
During her subsequent video chat with James, Emily seemingly unfazed attempts to probe the bump on her arm using a scalpel and meat fork, but James asks her to wait until he can come next week to examine it. The following night, the ghostly children overpower Emily just as James arrives. It is revealed that the children are aliens rather than ghosts. James had been conducting illegal experiments on Emily with the aliens. He reveals that the bump on her arm is a tracking device. The aliens erase Emily's memory and James inflicts injuries on her, making them appear as accidents once again. In their subsequent video chat, a badly injured Emily recounts her injuries as the result of wandering into traffic during a fugue state. She tells him that she has been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and says that James deserves a more normal girlfriend. James reassures her, but as their chat concludes, he initiates a conversation with a different woman who also has the same arm bump, revealing that James and the aliens are using women to make alien babies. In the frame story, both Zack and the old man's corpse have disappeared. Gary, the sole survivor, explores upstairs and discovers Zack's decapitated remains. He is then attacked by the zombified old man. Gary attempts to flee but falls and twists his ankle, ultimately meeting his demise at the hands of the zombie. The frame story concludes with the camera in the TV room starting the last tape on its own. October 31st, 1998. Tyler and his friends, dressed in various costumes, mistakenly enter what they believe to be a haunted house attraction. As they explore, they encounter paranormal occurrences but initially dismiss them as part of the experience. In the attic, they stumble upon a group of men conducting an apparent exorcism on a young woman suspended from the rafters. The friends unwittingly join in, sparking the men's anger. The situation escalates as some of the men are mysteriously pulled into the darkness above. It's not before long that the violent, paranormal phenomena intensify. Realizing the girl's plight, the friends return to rescue her, leading to a fierce battle with supernatural forces. They succeed in freeing her, causing the malevolent spirits to exact vengeance on her captors. As they flee the house, the friends encounter further bizarre occurrences and discover the girl they rescued is a witch. Trapped on train tracks, they cannot escape as a train approaches. The train wrecks into the car off camera. VHS 2 2013 in VH2, private investigators Larry and his girlfriend Aisha are tasked with locating a missing college student named Kyle. Their investigation leads them to Kyle's dorm room, where they discover a collection of VHS tapes and a laptop containing footage from Tape 56, the one that was shooting the criminal friends in the first movie. Aisha begins watching the tapes but is shocked to see a figure in the shadows. Phase 1 – Clinical Trials the first segment in the anthology titled Phase 1 Clinical Trials, directed by Adam Wingard and written by Simon Barrett, was shot in a doctor's office. Herman Middleton, who has suffered an eye injury in a car accident, receives an experimental ocular implant. The doctor warns Herman of potential glitches due to the experimental nature of the implant. Upon leaving the clinic, Herman becomes increasingly paranoid as he notices unusual occurrences at home. Objects move inexplicably, and he encounters ghostly figures, including a bleeding, seemingly undead man and a young girl who appears dead. Not knowing what to do, he spends a terrified night in the bathroom. Clarissa, a red-haired girl from the hospital, visits Herman, revealing that she can hear ghosts due to her cochlear implant. She explains that removing the implant won't eliminate the supernatural entities. It will merely prevent Herman from seeing them. As Herman's encounters with the ghosts escalate, his life tragically ends as the ghosts shove the implant down his throat, killing him. In the frame story, Aisha consults Larry about the tapes' authenticity and, upon his advice, continues watching. In Kyle's video, he emphasizes the importance of watching the tapes in the correct sequence for their intended impact, and Aisha proceeds to play a new tape. A Ride in the Park, the next segment. A Ride in the Park follows cyclist Mike, who records his ride through a forested state park with a helmet camera. During his ride, he encounters a blood-covered woman in distress, seeking help for her boyfriend. 
However, the woman quickly transforms into a zombie and attacks Mike, biting his throat. Mike manages to dispatch her, but succumbs to his injuries seemingly dying. Two fellow bikers discover Mike and attempt to call for assistance, but he revives as a zombie, attacking and killing the man. He also bites the woman before she flees. Mike joins the ranks of the undead, and together with the woman, they terrorize a young girl's birthday party, triggering a chain reaction of violence as victims turn into zombies. Amid their attempt to assault a family in a car, Mike glimpses his gruesome reflection in the car window, momentarily quelling his aggression. The trio of zombies then follows a distant sound, leading them to the source, the young girl's birthday party. They invade the party, causing chaos and death. Unexpectedly, Mike Pocket dials his girlfriend Amy, and upon hearing her voice, he regains some semblance of humanity. Overcome by remorse, he ends his own life using a discarded shotgun. In the frame story, Aisha, now entranced and experiencing a nosebleed, is woken up by Larry from the trance. Aisha says she has a severe migraine, and Larry leaves to get her medicine. Oblivious to her surroundings, she inserts another tape into the VCR. Unbeknownst to her, the mysterious figure from earlier emerges from the shadows again and begins to just stare at her. Safe Haven The next segment, Safe Haven, begins with a film crew on a documentary mission inside the secretive Indonesian cult called Paradise Gates comprising interviewer Malik, producer Lena, Malik's close friend Adam, and cameraman Joni. They aim to uncover the cult's strange and questionable practices. The crew uses an array of both normal and covert cameras. In the cult's compound, they encounter peculiar symbols adorning the walls, schoolchildren in classrooms, and women dressed in white garments. A woman only known as Madam grants them access, and they proceed to interview the cult's leader, called Father. During a break, Lena falls ill, and suspicions arise when Malik overhears her conversation with Adam, revealing her pregnancy with Adam's child. But Lena is Malik's fiance. Amidst the unsettling atmosphere, Adam stumbles upon an unforgettable sight in the basement. He sees a woman with her womb removed, strapped to a chair. Terrified, he flees. As father conducts an interview, an ominous bell chimes, marking the onset of the cult's mass suicide. Chaos ensues with cultists consuming poison and resorting to gunfire. Joni meets a grisly end at father's hands. Lena is abducted, Malik is shot dead, and Adam attempts to rescue Lena amidst explosions and eerie occurrences. He encounters the horned demon worshipped by the cult, which bursts from Lena's body. Battling cultists and resurrected ghouls, including Joni and Malik, Adam escapes to his car. In a horrific confrontation with the demon, he's gravely injured and the demon reveals itself as his child. Adam descends into madness marked by maniacal laughter as the camera abruptly malfunctions and cuts off. In the frame story, Larry returns to the room with medicine, only to discover that Aisha has taken her own life with a gun. Next to her lifeless body lies a VHS tape with the word, Watch, scrawled in lipstick. Overwhelmed by anxiety and curiosity, Larry picks up the tape, inserts it into the VCR, and begins to watch. Slumber Party Alien Abduction The following segment, titled Slumber Party Alien Abduction, centers on brothers Gary and Randy, who fit their dog tank with a camera to capture moments at their lakeside home. Left to their own devices as their parents go on a romantic trip, the brothers invite friends Sean and Danny over, and the boys pull pranks on their older sister Jen, her boyfriend Zach, and their friends. But they are unaware that just a few meters away, there is a lurking gray alien hiding beneath the water's surface. Later, that night, the group interrupts Jen and Zach's intimate moment with blaring music and flashing lights. A thunderous noise reverberates, which goes unnoticed by the group. Seeking revenge, Jen and Zack attach another camera to Tank, intending to return the favor. But the deafening sound returns, plunging the house into darkness. As Zack investigates, he encounters the alien from the lake, which seizes him, accompanied by other extraterrestrial beings. The aliens abduct the group, encasing them in their sleeping bags and submerging them in the lake. Only Gary, Randy, Jen, and Tank manage to escape and flee into the woods for cover. However, Tank inadvertently draws the alien's attention with his barking. The children believe they are heading towards police lights and sirens, but stumble into an alien trap. 
Here, the alien sees Randy. Jen and Gary hide in a nearby barn, but the aliens abduct Jen. And of course, no one survives. In the aftermath of viewing the tape, Larry proceeds to look into the webcam footage where Kyle, the kid who had apparently gone missing, discloses he and his mother wanted to make a similar tape of their own. An undead Aisha unexpectedly reanimates and attacks. Forced to defend himself, Larry grapples with Aisha, ultimately breaking her neck. He hastily retreats to another room as Aisha resurrects, now moving with an eerie animalistic gait, chasing after him. In the end, Kyle becomes the cause of Larry's death. VHS Viral In the third installment of the franchise, we meet Kevin, an amateur videographer who has this uncontrollable habit of filming his girlfriend Iris. Initially, she tolerates this, but her patience wears thin as she becomes increasingly uncomfortable with Kevin's obsession. It becomes evident that Kevin uses his camera as a coping mechanism to deal with his abusive grandmother, who subjects him to physical abuse off-screen. One night, a high-speed pursuit involving an ice cream truck comes to the neighborhood. He fails to capture the truck but notices Iris in a daze after receiving a mysterious video call, but she soon disappears. However, the ice cream truck runs over a police officer, and he begins chasing the truck after receiving some disturbing images of Iris on his phone. Meanwhile, people receive strange images on their cell phones that drive them to violent insanity. This prologue sets the stage for the unfolding events in the movie. Dante the Great In the Dante the Great segment, we meet John McMullen, a resident of a trailer park and an amateur magician with limited talent. His life takes a remarkable turn when he stumbles upon a cloak that once belonged to the legendary Harry Houdini. To his astonishment, wearing this cloak grants him the power to perform genuine magic. Adopting the stage name, Dante the Great, John uses his newfound magical abilities to become an overnight success. However, he soon discovers that the cloak demands regular human sacrifices to sustain its magical powers. John proceeds to employ a number of female assistants, recording their horrifying deaths as he recites incantations that cause the cloak to consume them. Scarlet, John's latest assistant, inadvertently stumbles upon his collection of tapes and she contacts the police. Despite being taken into custody, John manages to escape using his magical abilities. While Scarlet is being questioned by a detective, John uses his powers to teleport her from the police station. A subsequent SWAT team intervention ends tragically as John uses magic to eliminate them. In the end, John and Scarlet fight for authority over the magical cloak, and Sarah wins this deadly tussle. The cloak turns on John and feeds on him at Scarlet's command. Scarlet, now in possession of the cloak, attempts to destroy it by burning it. However, she is horrified to find it reappearing in her home, hanging ominously in her closet. As she investigates further, a pair of ominous shadowed arms emerge from the cloak and seize her, presumably ending her life. Back in the frame narrative, the pursuit of the mysterious ice cream truck continues, with both Kevin and the police hot on its trail. A group of curious teenagers attempt to capture the chase on camera. However, one of the teenagers becomes transfixed by his phone, and another falls from the bridge, ultimately getting run over by the truck. Despite obstacles, Kevin remains determined to rescue Iris. Parallel Monsters Set in Spain, we meet Alfonso, an inventor who is working late on his latest creation, an interdimensional portal. He assures his wife, Marta, that he will join her in bed soon. As he activates the portal, it opens to reveal what appears to be his own garage. To his astonishment, he encounters his doppelganger from a parallel world, and they both realize that the portal has successfully connected their universes. The two Alfonsos, driven by curiosity, agree to exchange places temporarily and document each other's worlds. As they explore, they find that the two worlds are eerily identical. However, disturbing differences begin to surface, in the parallel world, Alfonso encounters a different version of Marta and two men named Oriel. Growing increasingly alarmed, Alfonso flees from the house and witnesses a blimp with an inadverted cross, symbolizing a different dominant religion in the parallel world. As he attempts to document the blimp, he attracts the attention of the Orioles, who pursue him. The situation takes a nightmarish turn as their appearance and intentions become grotesque. 
Back in the normal world, the parallel Alfonso gets aroused by the original Marta and pulls out his demonic shaft, which obviously scares the living crap out of her. Furthermore, the parallel world Marta also has similarly disfigured genitalia. Meanwhile, the original Alfonso somehow manages to return to Earth, but the parallel world Marta follows and devours her Alfonso. But when the real Marta sees the real Alfonso, she kills him brutally, falsely assuming that he was the one who attacked her. In the midst of the ongoing pursuit, Kevin's desperate bid to free his girlfriend continues. Meanwhile, in a nearby neighborhood, a few Hispanic gang members gather to celebrate the release of one of their comrades from prison. Their festivities are interrupted when they spot a police helicopter broadcasting the chase, and one of them suspects that his girlfriend may have betrayed him. Suddenly, the music playing on the radio takes an unexpected twist, transforming into an operatic tune. This sudden change in music triggers a violent outburst from the guest of honor, who brutally attacks the others with forks. Amid the chaos, a ruptured gas tank causes an explosion, engulfing the party in flames as the truck and Kevin pass by, leaving behind a scene of devastation. The film then transitions to its next and final segment. We meet Jason and Danny, a pair of skateboarders living in Los Angeles, chasing the dream of creating an awe-inspiring skateboard video. Their videographer, Taylor, pushes them to perform increasingly risky stunts with the intent of capturing their potential injuries or worse, ultimately intending to sell it as a macabre snub film. Following a brawl at a local skate park, the skaters grow weary. Taylor proposes a trip to Tijuana, where there was supposed to be an isolated skateboarding location. They also call in a friend named Sean. Upon going south of the border, they lose the sense of direction and settle for practicing near a flood channel, where they also meet a mysterious woman. Unfortunately for everyone, one skateboarder sustains an injury and leans onto a pentagram etched onto the pavement. Strangely, his blood begins to boil, despite the normal temperature of the surrounding. Their mysterious acquaintance suddenly reveals reveals her true nature when she tears Taylor's arm off. In the ensuing chaos, a group of cloaked cultists appear. They had been using the channel for demonic rituals, and soon, they descended upon the skaters. Armed with skateboards, a pistol, and any makeshift weapons they can find, the skateboarders engage in a desperate battle for survival. During the clash, Sean is fatally wounded, bleeding out from his injuries. As a demonic roar echoes through the channel, the fallen cultists rise as reanimated skeletons. Faced with this supernatural menace, Jason and Daddy improvise by using the fireworks they purchased earlier, and they burn their skeletal enemies. With determination, they skate towards the border, leaving behind the nightmarish creature the cultists sought to summon. The creature seizes Taylor, whose fate is sealed as it devours him whole, along with his camera. Returning to the ongoing chase, the news broadcast Broadcasts are sounding the alarm about multiple fires erupting across the city. Kevin's relentless pursuit of the truck continues, and at one point, he encounters a woman in a trance-like state, her nose bleeding profusely. Concerned for her well-being, Kevin tries to flag down a passing taxi, but the driver refuses to stop. Unbeknownst to Kevin, the driver was assisting his friend, a porn director, in filming a striptease with a young woman in the back seat. But they all meet a grisly end when a police car hurtles through the air and crushes the taxi, claiming the lives of all three. At dawn, Kevin finally catches up with the truck and now sits motionless in the desolate river basin. Where he had previously filmed Iris, the vehicle was surrounded by scattered body parts. Kevin inspects the driver's seat only to discover it empty, with a pair of severed hands crudely affixed to the wheel with duct tape. Upon examining the rear of the truck, he encounters a stack of television, much like in the preceding films. To his astonishment, Iris appears on one of the screens, commanding Kevin to upload the footage 
to various broadcasters and the internet. Kevin gets worried about the videos causing a widespread insanity throughout the city. However, as Iris resorts to self-mutilation to make her point, he reluctantly presses a button labeled Upload. Outside, Kevin discovers the lifeless body of Iris, who had actually been dead for some time, slumped against the truck with her cell phone lodged in her mouth. Retrieving the phone from her mouth, Kevin finds it set in selfie mode. As he gazes at the screen, he's met with his own reflection, his nose also bleeding, implying that he too has succumbed to the influence of the videos. The film's closing shot, accompanied by the grand finale of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, captures the Las Vegas skyline. Smoke billows into the sky, lights flicker erratically, and a helicopter circles overhead. Marvelous Verdict The VHS series stands out as a unique blend of found footage and anthology horror. What started as an experimental venture in movie making turned it into a hit, spawning five sequels, a spin-off, and even a Snapchat series since its initial release in 2012. In total, the series boasts about 20 amazing short films, each directed by different horror filmmakers with varying experiences. With such a substantial catalog, it becomes hard to ignore such pieces of work. So if you haven't checked out the movies yet, well, you should. From zombies to cults, alien invasions to gruesome body horror, the series has covered a wide spectrum of horror themes. The question remains, which segments shine the best? And which should have been left behind? You know what? I'll let you answer that. And maybe we will take your suggestions into consideration when we make a video about the top 20 VHS segments. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.